Hi, this is Professor Dorr, and this is Lecture 15 of EE310. The title of the lecture is Fun with Transformers, which is really not a very good name, but what the lecture really is, is it's a review of coupled coil circuits that you saw in lecture number 13. If you want a nice little review of ideal transformers and impedance matching, go to lecture 14a. It's a supplemental lecture that I did that actually has a really cool problem in it. <clears throat> so in this lecture, you're going to get two examples of coupled coils, and we're going to use the dots on the transformer, <clears throat> I'm sorry, on the coils, and we're going to use dependence uh, sources, we're going to use those polarities, and we're going to sort that all out and solve those problems. And then I'm going to show you a very, very practical problem in printed circuit board design, um, where what we're going to do is we're going to take a circuit that somebody designed that didn't work the way they thought it to, and we're going to hypothesize um, uh, coupling in the coils, and then we're going to figure out exactly how much coupling there was. And when you're doing an interview later on, if transformers come up, or if they say, well, what did you learn about transformers? This is the example you want to bring up because this is exceptionally practical, and being able to find problems in printed circuit boards like this, a lot of people consider it a black art, but it's really nothing more than what you learn in this class. So let's get to our first example. In this example, I see two sources. So when I see two sources, I got one here and I got one here, first thing I'm going to do is see if they're the same frequency. Because if they don't have the same frequency, i got to work the problem with superposition. Because I'm going to get one um, component at one frequency and another component at the other frequency at every node uh, or mesh in the circuit. But in this case, um, the frequency is the same for both sources. So we can do the whole problem once. What else do I see? I see a clearly a Norton source here. And what I tell my students in class is when you see a source that looks like this, it's clearly a Norton source. Or if you see a source that's clearly a Thevenin source, visualize in your mind what it would look like if you did a source transformation because it may simplify the problem quite a bit. So we'll, we'll take a look at that um, down here. So let's see, I know where my dots are and I can see that the mutual inductance is 600 millihenries. So I'm gonna ask myself, are these coils coupling a little bit or a lot? Well. I know that the mutual inductance always has to be less than root L1, L2, and the, the mutual inductance is actually equal to K times L1, L2. So K goes from 0 to 1, just like we have here. M equals K root L1, L2. So let's figure out what the coefficient of coupling is. 0.6 over root 0.8 times 1.2. 0.8 times 1.2. All the factors of 10 cancel in that equation. And my coefficient of coupling is 61.2%. So yeah, those are coupling big time. So we want to find Ix here. And we're going to do it with mesh analysis. So I look at this circuit and I say, how do I make it look more meshish, if that's a word? And I see my Norton source, and I know I can really easily convert that to a Thevenin source. If I convert this to a Thevenin source, am I going to have any effect on the thing I'm trying to calculate? Nope. 
I'm going to have an effect in here, but as far as the rest of the circuit is concerned, it doesn't know the difference. So I can go ahead and do this Thevenin transformation. So my Thevenin voltage is going to be I sub S times R1. And one of the few things I actually remember is my Thevenin and my Norton impedances are the same. So now I'm just going to stick my R1 here in my Thevenin uh, source. I sub S is equal to 4 times the cosine of 600T. What's the frequency in Hertz? Is it any of those? It sounds like an easy question, but it's something that students miss quite frequently in exams. So in this case, this is a radian frequency. And so if I divide that by 2 pi, I'm going to get the frequency in hertz. So it's going to be around 200 hertz. So let's go with none of the above. So let's follow the four-step approach that we talked about in lecture 13. We've got our problem, and we've got our dots, we've got our mutual <coughs> uh, coupling, and we know we're going to solve it with the dependent sources, because that's like the total way to do it, because the housekeeping is so good. You know, one thing that's cool is when I took this course years and years and years ago, they didn't use the dependent sources. And I don't know it's because nobody had really thought of doing it that way, or that my professor, who just like an old fart, I'm an old fart for you guys, my professors were old farts for me, and they just weren't up on how people were doing it. So I didn't learn that this dependent source trick until I started teaching this class. So step number one <clears throat> is we're just going to draw our little dependent source symbol between the inductor and the dot. So we get one here. Here's our inductor. Here's our dot. Just put that right between them. So that's step number one. Step number two is let's put in the value of our induced voltage here. And in this case, I know the induced voltage here will come from the current in this inductor over here. The inductor current here is either going to be I2 minus I1, or it could be I1 minus I2. I could put either one right here. Now, I get the same answer in the end, because if I have I1 minus I2 here, I just switch my negative and positive signs. But here's what I like to do. I like to make the positive current up here be the current that's entering the dot on the donor. So the current that is positive as it enters the dot of the donor, I like to make that one first because that's going to allow me to put a plus to minus right here. You don't have to do that, but I just do it. So my step two is I just put in the value here, and I know it's going to be J omega M, and I chose I2 minus I1. And now over here, I know that this voltage is induced by I1, so I'm going to call it just J omega M I1. <clears throat> and I1 is going into the dot, so I'm following, I'm being consistent with my own little rule, which you don't need to use. It just keeps it consistent for me. So now it is time to vote. Sorry, my wife and my daughter are the only people that watch Survivor anymore, so I, I still hear that coming from downstairs. Um, so we've got our two sources, and I've kind of shown them here. Let's figure out what we, what is correct here. Let me give you a second to think about that. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Here, I see <clears throat> I2 entering the dot of L2. 
Therefore, I2 is going to make the dot of L1 more positive. I2 enters the dot of L2. So it's going to make the dot of L1 more positive. So I'm, I'm seeing a plus to minus right here. So that means it's either going to be C or D. Now let's look at this one. <clears throat> Um, for this source, I1 is entering the dot of L1. Therefore, it's going to make the dot of L2 more positive. So I'm going to say that I've got a plus to minus. Again, I1 enters the dot of L1. Therefore, the induced voltage will be positive at the dot of L2. You notice I'm using the definition of dots <clears throat> that we that I gave you in chapter 13 and is written in the book. So I'm seeing a plus to minus here. So before we said it's going to be C or D and I'm going to go with C. Let's see if we got it right. Plus to minus, plus to minus. Yep, looks like we did. So now I've gone through my third step which was assigning the polarities. The fourth step, <clears throat> forget about the dots. You're done with them. So now we just have a problem um, with some dependent sources. And that's actually pretty easy. <coughs> For I1, let's do our mesh. Minus ISR1 plus I1 R1 plus ZM I2 minus I1 plus ZL1 I1 plus ZL2 I1 minus I2 minus ZM I1 equals zero. And now of course, I rearrange that so that I can plop it into a matrix. Let's do mesh 2. Plus to minus, so ZM I1 plus I2 minus I1 ZL2 plus I2 ZC plus I2 R2 plus VS equals 0. Same thing. Separate out my I1s, my I2s, my constants. Throw it into a matrix and I get I1 and I2. And in order to get Ix, that's just going to be I1 minus I2. And here it is. Okay. Let's move on to our next example. And this example, it's kind of a monster because we've got three coils and they're all coupling. Look at this, I got J20 coupling these two, I got J10 coupling these two, I got J30 coupling these two. And it's in a bit of a funny network, but it's a network that you'll see here and there. It's called a bridged T network. Why? Here's your T, here's the bridge. And when you see a bridged T network, the analysis can kind of get stinky. But if you just get out there on the internet, there's all kinds of cool stuff that people have um, written down for bridged T networks that will help you. Okay, so where do we get started? Let's go to step one. In step one, I'm going to draw my little diamondy things for my dependent sources between the inductor and its dot. Here we go. So here's L2, and I got two dependent sources because L2 is going to get induced voltage from L1 and L3. So I'm going to kind of keep my, my housekeeping straight and say this one 
comes from mutual inductance 1 to 2, or 1 to 2. This one come is from 3 to 2. So it's from 3 to 2. So same sort of thing down here. Each one of these coils is going to have two dependent sources associated with it. But for right now, all I'm worried about is just getting those little diamonds in the right place. And I know there's going to be a monster problem, so I'm going to deal with some housekeeping. So I'm going to call this A, and I'll put a circle around it. Maybe a circle is the, the housekeeping symbol. Here's B, C, D, E, F. So what let's do is let's figure out what these donors, or what these um, are going to be. So step two is going to be assigning the value of each dependent source. So let's go to A. And I know that A, I wrote down a 1, 2. So it's basically um, the voltage induced here by this coil. So it's 1, 2. If I want, I could call it 2, 1, right? Because it's reciprocal. And so in this coil, the current is going to be the difference between I1 and I2. But I see that I2 flows into the dot of L1. So I'm going to put it first here. I make the current entering the dot of the donor, L1's the donor, positive. So I have S time, or J omega times M1 one, two times I2 minus I1. So now I2 enters the dot, and so it's going to make the dot of L2 more positive. So here we go, plus, minus. Write a plus here and a minus here. Now let's go to B. The donor for B is going to be coil 3, because you can see I wrote a little M23 up here. This isn't a value. This is just housekeeping. I'm just trying to keep things straight here. So I know that the current in coil 3 is the difference between I3 and I2. So I could make my value I2 minus I3. That'd be fine. It just means the polarity would be opposite. But I pick I3 minus I2 because I make the current entering the dot my first one. So I make it the positive one in this expression. So that's going to be I3 because it's entering this dot. So I3 minus I2, and here it is, J omega M23, because that's the mutual inductance, times I3 minus I2. And then I say, hey, I3 makes the dot, enters the dot of L3, so it's going to make the dot of the induced voltage inductor, the recipient, positive. So I got a plus minus right here, plus minus. Let's move on to C. So C. I've got M12 shown here. So what I this voltage on coil 1 is induced by the current in coil 2. And the coil in 2 in uh, L2, the current in, in L2 comes from the difference between I3 and I1. And I see that I1 enters the dot of L2. So I'm going to put that first in my value. So I have S times M12, I1 minus I3. Well, I1 enters the dot of L2, so it's going to make the dot of this source positive. So I'm going to have a plus to minus right here. Let's move to D. 
So D is going to be the voltage induced on L1 coming from the current in L3. The current in L3 comes from the difference between I3 and I2. And I can see that I3 enters the dot, so I'm going to make it positive in my expression here. So for my value, I'll write I3 minus I2. Now, I notice that I3 enters the dot of L3, therefore it's going to make the dot of L1 more positive. And I have a plus and a minus. Let's move on. Now we're at E, and so we're looking at the voltage that is, that is generated in L3 as a result of the, the current in coil 2. And so here's coil 2, and the current in coil 2 is the difference between I3 and I1. Now I notice that I1 goes into the dot of coil 2, so I'm going to write this as I1 minus I3. And I1 enters the, the dot of L2, so that is going to make the dot of L3 positive. So that's going to give me a plus right here and a minus right here. Now let's go to F. And for F, I have my little M13 telling me that that is um, the current in L1 inducing a voltage in L3. And so the current in L1 is the difference between I2 and I1. And since I2 enters the dot of L1, I'm going to make it positive in my, in my voltage value here. Because I2, if it enters the dot of L1, it's going to make the dot of L3 more positive, and I'm going to put a plus minus right here. So those are all the steps. And you see that by setting these values so that the positive current was always the one flowing into the dot of the donor, um, I ended up with dots. Let's sneak over to my, my secret notes here. Um, For every one of my inductors, the positive signs of the source were all on the dot. And that's why I do that. You don't have to do that, but I do it because when I'm done doing it the way I, I like to do it, or in other words, by making the positive number here um, the current that flows into the dot of the donor, when I'm done with the problem, I look at it, and I want to see pluses on all my dots. So it's just something that may help you. I hope it does. So now we get to the problem that I said was a very practical problem uh, for printed circuit boards, but it uses all the theory that we're learning in the class. So. Here's a circuit that some engineer designed. And it was designed with the idea that there would be no coupling between these inductors. Because engineers, especially rookie engineers, or engineers that aren't used to working at high frequency, often mistakenly make that assumption, and then their circuits don't work very well. So in this case, the engineer designed this circuit, fired it up, and didn't get the values that he or she expected. So the circuit doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It's because 
the output voltage out here did not equal the design value. So the first thing that you could do is hypothesize that the inductors are bad. Um, engineers tend to like to blame components for things. It's rarely the components fault, but you take your components, your L1 and L2, dig them out of the circuit and go measure them on an analyzer and you find that, yep, at the frequency of interest, this one's J6 and that one's A. So I got no trouble, no problem with the components themselves. And to be honest, what I would do is I'd take a good look at the PC board design and I would look and see if the inductors were shielded or not, or what sort of core they had, because the core tells me how much permeability, uh, I'm sorry, the type of core tells me the permeability, and the permeability tells me how, um, how happy the magnetic fields will be to stay uh, in that core. But if it's not a round core, um, I know it's spitting out a magnetic field all over that board. So my circuit doesn't work. My inductors are fine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hypothesize mutual inductance. I'm going to just say, I think those inductors are coupling with each other. And I'm going to try to figure out whether by hypothesizing mutual coupling, I can get the result that the engineer got. So what I'll do is I'll look at the circuit and I'll just try to visualize those magnetic field lines. And I'm going to hypothesize where the dots are on those coils. Now you could say, but the data sheet tells you where the dots are. Not when you have two separate coils you made a transformer. You've got to figure out where the dots are. So I'm just going to hypothesize where they are. And if I don't, if I can't recreate the result that the engineer got, I'll turn the dots around and do it again. So first thing I'll do is compute the expected output with the mutual inductance at zero. Why do I do that? Because this is the design value. You never know, maybe the engineer just didn't design the circuit right. But if I analyze the circuit with m equals zero, and I get the result that the engineer expects, then I kind of know I'm doing things right. And then what I'll do is I'll look at the output voltage, and I will adjust my m in my equations until I match the voltage that the engineer um, measured. So I measure the output voltage from the circuit, the circuit that doesn't work. And now I'm going to just adjust M in my equations. That's easy to do in MATLAB until I can match what that engineer measured. And if I can do that, I can say, you have a mutual coupling problem, and here's how bad it is. So I take a look at the engineer's circuit, and I, I just take um, an educated guess, because I do look at the geometry and I say, I bet the dots are here. So now I start my analysis, and I use my four-step program. So I'm going to draw my little diamonds between the inductor and its dot. Inductor, dot, diamond. And then I'm going to get the value of the source. Um, let's do this one first. This induced voltage comes from I2. And turns out I2 is entering the dot. So we'll just call this Z sub M I2. Now let's take this one. Here, I know that the induced voltage comes from the difference between I2 and I1. And I1 enters the dot, so I'm going to put it first here. And I'm going to get Z sub M times I1 minus I2. And then I'm going to look, and even though I know the answer at this point, I know where those plus and minuses go, I'm going to say, um, for this one here, I1 enters the dot, 
It's positive. It generates positive voltage. I got a positive on my dot. So for this inductor, I2 enters the dot. So it's going to make the dot of this inductor more positive. So now I've got my signs. So I go to step four, which is I blow the dots off because I don't need them anymore. So I just grind through my mesh equations. I've got minus Vs plus R1 I1 plus Zc times I1 plus Zm I2 plus I1 minus I2 Zl1 equals zero. I rearrange so that I have my unknowns all grouped together, so I'll be ready to put it in a matrix. And now let's move to mesh number two. And my order here is a little funny, but what we're going to do is we have uh, ZL1 times I2 minus I1 minus ZMI2 plus ZM times I1 minus I2 plus I2 times ZL2 plus I2R2 equals zero. And again, we arrange those so we separate out our, our variables and our constants, and we throw them into the matrix, and we get our V out, which is equal to I2 times R2. Now, you notice, though, in my equations here, I can set ZM to anything I want. <clears throat> so what I did is I started off with Zm equals zero in this equation. And I got Vo is equal to this value right here, 41.45 at an angle of 11.15 degrees. And I asked the engineer, is this what you think you were going to get or what you were expecting? Yep, absolutely. So now I know that my analysis agrees with the engineer's analysis. So now let's look at what we got um, on the when we actually did the waveform, the measurements. I put in my 100 volts peak. Yeah. I put in a 100 volts peak here. And I looked at my V out. And I saw that I had right around here, around 30. And I was off by about 8 degrees in phase. So I was expecting 41.45 at an angle of 11.15. But I got more like 30. So my amplitude was really off. My phase was off by a little bit. So I could see that the circuit wasn't working right. So then what I did, um, this got back to where we started. But you can see that the desired phase was 11.15 degrees. We got about 8 degrees, and that's pretty hard to see. But we expected an amplitude of 41 with no mutual coupling but we got 27. That's easy to see. So let's just change our mutual coupling. So at J1 for mutual coupling, I got 39.3. And remember, I'm trying to match the 27 that I measured from the circuit is 27. So J1, I got 39. That wasn't enough. J2, V out came down a little bit. J3, K, J4, whoops, too far. So I wiggled it around for a while. And I finally got with a, a mutual inductance of, three point, of J3.77, I matched it. My output voltage was right. And check it out, my phase was right. So at this point, I know that the problem with that circuit is coming from mutual coupling. So 
since I need to report back to the boss on this, I don't want to tell him that I have J3.77 ohms of mutual coupling. I want to tell him what the coefficient of coupling is. And so I'm going to take my m divided by root L1, L2. And you might ask, can I do this? And the answer is yes, I can. So I just substitute in these numbers. And I got J3.77 over root J6 times J8. And I got 54.42. So now I know that my mutual coupling is 54%. Now, if the mutual coupling was 1%, I'd go, ugh. It's really hard to go from 1% down to zero. I may have to make my board much bigger. Or I may have to buy really expensive shielded inductors or something. So if the mutual coupling was 1%, I'd have to figure out how to live with it. But my mutual coupling is 54%, which just means it's a sloppy design. And it's really easy to get that 54% down to 3 or 4%. So let's actually look at the, um, at the way, at, I'm sorry, at the PC board um, layout. And this is how the components are actually laid out on the PC board. Here's our circuit. Now let's look at how L1 and L2 were sitting on the board. I looked at it and they laid them right out next to each other because it looked pretty. But boy, was that magnetic field happy to go from L1 to L2. That's why that coefficient of coupling was so high. So what can I do? Shall I move things this way? Shall I move R2 a little bit? Uh-uh, because that magnetic path, you could just visualize it going through there. Let's do this. Let's take L1 and L2 and put them 90 degrees to each other. We did that, and that coefficient of coupling went from 54% down to about 3%, which was barely even noticeable. So like I mentioned in lecture 13, you will see on PC boards, if they're inductors in close proximity to each other, uh, especially in a filter where you want those inductors to act independently, you'll very frequently see them laid out at right angles to each other. And that's why. Let's wrap this lecture up with something else that's practical. <clears throat> I want to look at a technique that you'll see in industry quite a bit um, called center tapped, center tapping the transformer. Remember we mentioned that a transformer gives you DC isolation. So let's look at this circuit. We got an ideal transformer. We've got a 60 hertz supply here. And on our secondary, instead of having two wires come out, we have three. And as the name kind of implies, this one is right in the middle. So now I'm feeding that center tap with a signal. So let's take a look at this. What is the DC value going to be at V plus and V minus? Go back to that example where we had 15,000 volts. Well, I have 10 volts here, and let's forget about this 5 hertz for a while. 10 volts here, and there's no return path. So that means there's no current flowing. There's no current flowing here. And this is an inductor, so it has no voltage across it at DC. So I got 10 volts here, 10 volts here, right, because I'm 10 volts here. Got no voltage drop, no voltage drop. I'm 10 volts here, 10 volts here. No voltage drop across the resistor, so I got no current flow through the resistor. So 
I got 10 volts DC everywhere on the secondary. Or in other words, I take my multimeter and I put the black lead to ground and I take my red lead and I go 10 volts, 10 volts, 10 volts, 10 volts. How about over here? I have no idea. We're not coupled over there. We have no DC coupling. But I'm 10 volts everywhere in here. Now I'm going to turn this 5 hertz supply on. So now I'm still going to have 10 volts DC, but what's going to happen since there's no path back down to ground here, it's not going to cause any current to flow, my V plus and V minus are both going to be going up and down together. So with everything enabled here, I see 10 volts DC at both V plus and V minus, and both of them are going up and down um, with this supply at 5 hertz. So this signal is, is what I see here is here and here. So V plus equals V minus equals 10 plus whatever the amplitude here is with a cosine in it. Now, I'm going to go through, I'm going to take this signal, this V plus and V minus, and they're going to control a dependent source. And the dependent source, the voltage of this dependent source is V plus minus V minus. So when this path is active, remember V plus and V minus are both doing the same thing. Look at my hands. Here's V plus and here's V minus. They're up at 10 volts and then they're both moving together. Actually, they're, they're the same value. So V plus and V minus are exactly the same. Is there a difference between them? No. So what's the output of my dependent source? It's zero because V plus equals V minus. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take into account the 60 hertz input here. Now in this case, uh, let's say the turns ratio is 1. When I turn this on, I'm going to get an AC voltage across these two terminals. See that? I get an AC voltage here. So that is going to get amplified by my dependent source. So here's the deal. I can put whatever I want on this center tap, and I'm not going to see it at the output of this dependent source. And you might say, so what? Well, here's the deal. We use transformers and center taps of transformers to put DC bias onto circuits. Like if I had a transistor circuit, in this case a differential amplifier, if I have a transistor circuit here, I can put that 10 volts on both of these, um, these um, signals right here. So I've given them a DC bias so I can turn my transistor on. <clears throat> but that DC bias <clears throat> is what we call a common mode voltage here, <coughs> meaning it's common to both V plus and V minus. <clears throat> so a circuit like this is a differential amplifier. And what we're showing is that this voltage, which is the common mode voltage, doesn't get amplified by the differential amplifier because it's only amplifying the difference. But I can put a DC offset into this amplifier which turns everything on. And you'll really see that when you get into EE330 and EE430. And you'll especially see it in my EE430 lab because I wrote the lab where we actually do exactly this and I put this great big common mode signal here, um, which um, it could be pickup on a microphone cable going across the floor of a bar, right? Um, 
So we put this big common mode signal on there and we find that it's completely rejected by the differential amplifier. So you actually see that in the lab in 430. So I hope you all sign up for 430 and um, get in my section because because we have a lot of fun. Okay, those are our lectures on transformers. Next, we're going to move into frequency response. I look forward to having you at that next lecture. And as always, I look forward to seeing all my students at my office hour.